This is a story about some people, some American people, who live along the Ohio River in a valley nestled amid three states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And in this story, the heroes and heroines are numbered by the thousands. This is a story of their courage, their know-how, their ingenuity and determination to do a job. It's a story of sweat and spirit, the typical American fighting spirit unsurpassed anywhere on earth. Yet these men and women are always amazed to hear statements like this about themselves. Because to them, what do you mean fighting spirit? Must be talking about our kids. They went to war. The rest of us, we just stayed home and worked. And nothing exciting ever happens around here. I don't know what you're talking about. All right, so along with everything else, we'll add modesty to the list of laurels and let the facts speak for themselves. Our story begins back in early 1944 in the mills of the Weirton Steel Company, where more than 12,000 men and women were turning out tons and tons of steel. Steel to smash the enemy. Steel for tanks and planes, for ships and guns. Steel for bayonets and bombs. Steel for the war of steel. And they were turning it out by the record tons. Two, four, five, then seven new world records were broken with the tons and tons of steel they produced. With skill, with know-how, with muscles and sweat, they turned out special alloy steels. Steel for forgings and high carbon steel. And in addition to tons of steel, they rolled copper and even magnesium and silver. They astounded not only the enemy, but the entire industry when, on massive steel rolling mills, they took on the unheard of task of rolling brass, not by the pound, but by the ton, something that had never been done before. Yes, the men and women at Weirton Steel were doing a job, a vital production job that Uncle Sam was proud to hail with the coveted Army Navy E. A job, a production job well done. This was the kind of production the enemy couldn't understand as he crouched back of his concrete fortifications on the coast of France and in the Italian mountains. He couldn't understand that, just as he couldn't understand an army preparing to attack, preparing for D-Day with an overwhelming mass of steel instead of masses of human flesh and blood. We were relying on superior firepower, not supermen or even sons of heaven, but firepower and plenty of it. And the army wanted more. D-Day was coming fast. So on the 28th of March, 1944. Weirton Steel Company. Yes, Colonel Downey. I'll connect you with Mr. Millsop. That's right. The eight inch projectile, the M106. Think you people at Weirton can make it for us? It's a 200 pound high explosive howitzer shell. That means forging and then machining high carbon steel, right? Right. But you folks can do it. How soon can we see the specifications so we can get started? <laughs> As a matter of fact, Major Cox is on the way down to see you now. He has the blueprints with him. And that's exactly what happened. Major Cox, the Army Ordnance Officer, was on his way, and practically within the hour, the men and women of Weirton Steel had taken on another tremendous job, the job of making eight-inch shells, making firepower to save precious American lives. No time for a new building now. Pull everything out of the old warehouse, pour a concrete floor, order special machines and tools. It'll take hundreds of them. It means forging furnaces, Presses, conveyors, cutting lathes, pumps, compressors, and complete machine shops, too. Price? Contract? We'll worry about that later. Quantity? We'll take the entire quota for the Pittsburgh Ordnance District. Let's get going. And get going they did. And in exactly 189 days, months and months ahead of schedule, the first carload of 8-inch high-explosive shells was shipped from Weirton Steel. It was a tough job, too, but they did it. They did it fast, and they did it right. But by now, the Army had cracked the outer wall of Fortress Europe and was racing toward the vaunted Siegfried Line and also penetrating deeper into the mountain retreats of Italy. And the Army was calling for more, 
and still more of the shattering, the devastating firepower of the eight-inch howitzer shell, more of the firepower made by the people of Weirton. And the people of Weirton answered this call and immediately went on a full 24-hour production shift seven days a week. For weeks, hundreds and hundreds of them worked 12 and even 16-hour shifts until enough new men and women could be trained to help turn out the thousands of shells that we and our allies were throwing in the teeth of the Huns. That's what we mean by the spirit of Weirton. Look, maybe you can see that spirit at work as we watch the shells being made. You won't see it right away, but it's there. At first, maybe you just see the material, the special high carbon steel that the men in the blooming mill and the structural mill just across the street has skillfully rolled into the long, round, cornered square blooms. Maybe you don't see it as you watch the gang saws cutting the blooms into proper length, or as you watch the electric flash nick the bloom, making it ready for the next important step. The nick across the center ensures an even break for the bloom when it goes under the giant breaking press, when the bloom is broken like a stick across your knee. The cross-section reveals a true picture of the uniformity, the quality of the steel. Any flaw in the interior could be clearly seen by the government inspector. Here's where the results of steel-making skill begin to be seen. Not a single quality reject in the thousands and thousands that have been inspected at this point. You begin to feel a little of the spirit of the people as you watch the infinite care, the constant quality control they maintain over the heat in the big forging furnaces. Nothing is left to chance. When the temperature is right to the exact degree, the blooms are ready for their first step, the slow three-hour bath in high heat. The sheets of asbestos paper are used to separate the blooms, keep them from fusing under the heat. When the hard steel has been heated to an even, almost white-hot temperature, a thousand-ton pierce press hollows out its heart, makes the all-important cavity that holds the high explosives. When the eight-inch howitzer shell, its cavity loaded with almost three gallons of TNT, hits a concrete pillbox, it explodes and rips its way through with the force of a volcano from hell. That's the kind of firepower they're making here with equipment like this 250-ton draw press, an exclusive design for firepower. Test it, check it, send it on its way. That shell has a date with the enemy. Oh, but they're not through with it yet. There's more work to be done to ensure its absolute accuracy and power of penetration. It must be kept rolling while cooling on a long conveyor and the cavity cleaned with a powerful blast of steel shot. Then each shell gets a rigid inspection for concentricity, length of forging, thickness of the base, contour and diameter inside and out, plus an inspection for cavity defects. Do you begin to get a reflection of that pride, that spirit of Weirton as these shells go on their way? Look for it here as the operator places the shell in this vertical centering machine because this is one of the most important steps in the entire shell making operation. The center must be exact, and exact it is. That's the pride of workmanship we're talking about. Look for it here, too, as this munitions maker begins to shape the shell for action by pre-rough turning, or here, during this streamlining operation known as facing the base and forming the pip. The pip is used for centering to ensure absolute accuracy during the machining operations that follow, like this second rough cutting step. And what happens now? More inspection. Every tiny detail must be checked and checked again. Each shell on this line is destined to smash an enemy target, so the shape and weight must be exactly the specification. Here's an interesting step in the shell making process. The open end of the shell is gradually heated in this special furnace. The first four inches of the shell are heated for two minutes. Then it is moved in for another five inches. Four minutes later it is moved in again. 
10 minutes later, the shells are ready and they are removed and placed in the powerful 500 ton vertical hydraulic nose press that shapes the hot steel. Now the machine forgings begin to look like shells, streamlined firepower, personal messages from the men and women of Weirton Steel. Yes, once again the nation had turned to them for help on a vital and almost impossible job in the battle of production. But why not? Hadn't they accomplished what seemed impossible before? Look at their war production record. No work stoppages of any description whatever since long before Pearl Harbor. The lowest rate of absenteeism in the entire industry. Plus their world record breaking production achievements. No wonder the army said that they had earned a reputation for doing their jobs with speed and with efficiency. The men and women of Weirton are, as the army put it, battle tested ready and fully able to be entrusted with the important job of producing the much needed firepower, shells to save American lives, firepower to drive the enemy back, back until they are beaten for all time to come. After the shells have been heated, hardened in an oil quench and tempered in a second furnace, again they are cooled on this long conveyor. This is in preparation for still further machining. But before that, each one is given a special test to determine the hardness of the newly tempered metal. Every shell must meet the rigid standards of quality set up by the Army Ordnance Department. Then, just to be doubly sure, the laboratory sends for sample sections to be cut from every batch of shells. In the laboratory, the sample piece of shell steel is measured and carefully marked, then placed in a powerful pulling machine where it is given a test for its tensile strength. Up, 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 now over 120,000 pounds per square inch. There she goes. That's tough steel. When the shells have passed the test, they're ready to be moved across the river to the finishing line in Weirton Steubenville plant. There goes firepower way ahead of schedule. And for every five shells promised, the men and women of Weirton Steel delivered seven. Like a bull, a shell can be handled more easily if it has a ring in its nose. So Weirton Steel makes that too. Makes it on a forge and anvil that the ancient god of weapons, Vulcan, himself might envy. It's a screw plug that fits in the nose of the shell. After they've been forged and trimmed, and trimmed some more, they go through the tumble blast machine for smoothing and polishing. Then the base is threaded, and the screw plugs get a chemical bath a weatherproofing, and of course, a rigid inspection. Over across the river in the Steubenville plant, the nosed and heat-treated shell forgings are brought in for the finishing operations. The first step in the finishing operations is the chucking of the shell for boring and facing the nose. Machining a shell is a job that demands skill and accuracy of the highest type. Skill, accuracy, and inspection. Just as each step and operation in the forgings call for complete control, all the machine work on every shell must also be right to exact dimensions. Accuracy in the machining means the difference between just making shells and producing firepower. Firepower designed to hit where it hurts the most. And that's why the work of every man and woman on every machine is done with such extreme care. Because even the slightest variation might throw the shell out of line, cause it to miss its mark, the machine operators are trained for precision workmanship. And every step of the operation is inspected because every step is important. For instance, when the band groove is cut, it has to be deep enough, yet not too deep. If the cut is too deep, the shell might be dangerously weakened. Yes, work like this is more than just a job in a factory. It's frontline fighting in the battle of production. It's American skill, engineering, and managing know-how pitted against the enemies. It's the sweat and spirit of free men pitted against slavery. This is the wriggler in action, cutting a wave in the band groove that will ensure a perfect grip when the band is placed around the shell. And again, inspection. Inspection by Weirton and also by the official government inspectors. This is firepower. They make it fast and they make it right and nothing gets by these trained eyes unless it is right. That's why this correction lathe stands by, ready to rectify any possible irregularity the inspectors find in the shell. Yes, this firepower has to be right, 
It has to be accurate because it's made to save the lives of American boys, the husbands, the brothers, the sweethearts, and sons. Absenteeism? Take a day off now and then? Ask this lady here on the shell line. She has four sons, four personal reasons for making firepower. She and her three daughters are all in war plants, all fighting the battle of production. There they go, boys. There's your firepower. And each one right up to specifications. Each one way ahead of schedule. Production, production and more production by the managers and planners, by the department heads, the engineers, the expediters, by the men and women of Weirton's Mills. But wait a minute, Weirton has always been a steel plant. Where did these special machines come from and what about the thousands of skilled shell makers? Where did they come from? The company didn't bring in any outside labor. We know that. Well, as for the machines, when the manufacturer, the tool maker, said he just didn't have the necessary manpower to make all the lathes and shell turning and knurling machines that were needed, the men of Weirton went directly into the tool maker's shops and actually helped with the construction of the specialized cutting machines and tools they needed to turn out firepower. Then they brought him back and taught the new people how to run them. And the new people, where did they come from? They were from the shops. Some were blacksmiths, some were heat treaters, riggers, carpenters, painters, repairmen, machinists. They came from the offices as well as in the mills. They came from almost every department in the plant and they came from the homes of other employees. They were trained, they learned to be shell makers as fast as was humanly possible. Every eight inch shell that's made is given a lot number and then an identification mark that means made by the men and women of Weirton Steel. The next step is to send each shell through the degreasing machine where hot vapors clean the shell completely, removing all traces of oil and grease, both inside and out. Then, for added safety when the shell is fired, an extra plate of tough, thin steel is welded on the bottom. Now, more cleaning, again with a powerful blast of steel grit. And naturally, still more inspection. Then a protective coat of rust-proofing oil and a bath to cool them off and prepare them for the next machining step. The temperature of the shell must be exactly right for this all-important operation. This is known as machining the burrelet, the only part of the shell, aside from the brass rotating band, which actually touches the gun barrel. Precision cutting is needed here to protect the gun barrel and also to ensure absolute accuracy as the shell streaks for its target. The brass band, the part that gives the shell its rotating motion, comes out of the furnace at a red heat. Then it's placed over the nose of the shell and forced into the band groove with a 2,000 pound hydraulic segment press. And the waves in the band groove hold it tight. Next, the shell is cooled again, then tightly clamped into a machine that holds it steady while the all important fuse thread is cut inside the nose. Now the brass band is turned down to its final special contour and exact dimensions. You can note the skill, you can measure the accuracy, but you can only feel the spirit that's part of each operation on every single shell. The people of Weirton Steel showed the entire world an example of that spirit during the winter of 1944. Remember these headlines? Fighting against guns of Siegfried Line. Deep into Siegfried defenses. Then the furious Nazi counter-drive. American casualties huge. Nazis wedged deeper into Belgium. We were running out of ammunition, and General Eisenhower was calling for more firepower with all speed. But Weirton was making shells, making them way ahead of schedule, making more than they said they would, for the workers here had imposed no artificial limits, no quotas on the number of shells they would make in a day or a month. They just made them as fast as they could. They had a war to help win. Their one task was to keep production records going up and up. And they did it. First, 12,500 shells. Then up to 53,000. Then 64,000. And finally, better than 70,000 shells per month. And not only the regular employees came through in this military emergency, but members of their families and their friends too rolled up their sleeves and came into the plants to help make shells. 
In fact, citizens from all over the tri-state area came to help wherever they could. They learned how to make shells fine and fast, and they caught the feel of that something we've called the spirit of Weirton Steel. They worked nights, they worked days, they worked Sundays and holidays too. They were producing firepower for General Eisenhower and his men. They made the shells, and they also made, repaired, and sharpened the cutting tools with which to make still more shells. With the whirl of the grinding wheel for a carol and the flying sparks for tinsel, they celebrated Christmas Eve and Christmas Day as well. There was no time out for holiday celebrations like Christmas or New Year's. All through the plants, they kept the day in their hearts and thought of the old-fashioned Christmases yet to come. But they stayed on the job. There was important work to be done, firepower to make, and firepower saves American lives. So the shells were made ready. A protective collar placed around the brass band. And they were given the final inspection. Loaded into cars for fast freight trains and delivered to Uncle Sam where they were loaded with TNT and painted a bright yellow that meant high explosive. Again, just to be doubly sure, Shells from each batch were sent to the ordnance proving ground. The nose ring replaced by the timing fuse and the shell given a test, a very practical test. And the shells were okay, they were made that way. So they were sent to the boys at the fighting front with all possible speed on fast freight trains, destroyers, and even the air. And the rest, we already know. with the help of firepower. And that's the story of the men and women of Weirton Steel. A story typical of all American industry and the people who helped win the battle of production.